Devani. Located in the heart of downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan, Devani is artisanal. Devani is craftsmanship. Devani is effortlessly trendy but timelessly classy all at once. With its massive dark hardwood bar, soft lighting, and signature smoky cocktails, Devani is comfortable and inviting, yet it feels exclusive. It's as if Huga, the Danish concept of coziness, had a hip, edgier cousin. Tattoos, piercings, along with Italian leather shoes, vintage denim, and a bespoke blazer. That's Devani. The cuisine at Devani, distinctly American yet globally inspired, is in tune with that exact vibe. Bold twists on classic comfort. Take a look at this, the Devani burger. Eight full ounces of house ground brisket, applewood smoked bacon, arugula, garlic aioli, and a red wine onion compote. Between the smokiness of the bacon, the peppery notes of the arugula, and the bite of the garlic, the Devani burger is as delicious as it is complex. Complex, just like my guest, Stu McAllister, today's remarkable person. He's a stand-up comic, a former MC at Grand Rapids premier comedy club, Dr. Grins, and a wickedly funny podcaster. Today, we will dig deep into the bumpy, on-the-road life of a comedian. Stu's been creating comedy and making people laugh for over 16 years. He's connected to just about anyone who is anyone in comedy. Oh, and fair warning, Stu and I get a bit vulgar. I blame Stu for that, actually. We include some F-bombs, so that makes this episode of Seared for adults only. Just like a comedy club. I'm Jay Mays, and this is Seared. Amazing food, remarkable people. So, Stu? Yeah, hey. Hey. How are you, man? <laughs> the, We're gonna have lunch. I know, it's gonna be exciting. Yeah. Welcome to Seared. Thanks. I appreciate you doing this. Hey, so, sure, sincerely. man. It's, it's my honor. Dude. It's your honor? Someone wants to talk That's to me. That's the nicest Amazing. thing you could have said. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've got the drink order in. I think we'll, let's talk comedy. All right. You ready for that? Yes. So, the first question, I, all the questions kind of have a name, usually. Okay. Like, uh, the first one's called the igniter. It's a grill. It's a grill, right? Sure. You have the igniter. So, I really wanted to know about your entrance into comedy. Like, why? Like, what clicked one day and went, "I got to do this." Right. It was uh, just going to Dr. Grin's club here in yes. Grand Rapids, yeah. and they do shows Thursday through Saturday. And Thursday was like the half price day. And so I'm like going, I'm cheap. Let's see the show for half the cost. Sure. I'll do it. I don't need to see it on a Friday or Saturday. And they, uh, the guy who ran at the time, who was the MC there, Dr. Billy Grins, okay. very famous comedian, super famous. And uh, he ran the open mic there. And uh, they were always uh, struggling to find people to get on stage. It wasn't, this was 16 years ago. Right. And they, the scene wasn't what it was today. Gotcha. And so they, they struggled to find people and it usually was the same people every week because it would just, it was sort of like you just show up, hey, you want time? Sure. And then after a while of just going to see shows mm -hmm. and then seeing the same guys do stuff week after week. And then it was like, I am I now have to prove myself because I'm going, I feel like I'm funnier than that guy. Yeah, that guy sucks. <laughs> Is that how every comedian starts? Like, probably. I'm better than him. I'm better yeah. than her. Or dares or that dares, kind of yeah. thing. Of like, come on, man, you got to get on stage, you know? Or yeah. you're the funny one in the group. Get up there. And, yeah. and that, I, I think it, it's changed again from when I started because nowadays there's so much comedy available, like whenever, mm -hmm. whether it's like Netflix or YouTube or Comedy Central, all the stuff that's 24 seven comedy. Individual podcasts. Sure, uh, XM Series Satellite Radio, yeah. what, whatever you, you want. to tune in. And so I think people at a young age, people who are like 10, 11 years old are like, yeah, I want to do comedy. And when I was 10 or 11, I was like, I'm gonna go play in the sand, or you know, like I, ne I never had thoughts like that. Sure. And then, yeah. uh, so to me, when I meet, I, I've met a lot of young people now, and they're like, yeah, I wanted to be a comedian like since I was in high school, and so they've kind of gearing their life towards that. Interesting. And that blows my mind away because I'm still just like, I, I'm doing everything wrong, and I'm not even sure I know what I'm doing. What age did you start? Like when 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 did that click for you? Uh, for comedy, yeah. I was 34. Three thirty-three. Yeah, is yeah. that is that a late start? Is that a late bloomer? Super late. Okay. I would not encourage anyone 
uh, who's in their mid 30s or older to start. Sure. Uh, and usually it's also, be, I, I'm, I'm in the strange position where like, I'm not married, I don't have kids, so I can, I can do whatever the hell I want. Yeah. Where most people who are 33, 34, are probably married with kids and then they got life obligations. Sure. And comedy kind of dictates to whatever your life obligations are, fuck them. Right. Because you need to put all your energy <laughs> into this stupidity. This is what you're doing. And, uh, yeah, because you do a lot, of, a lot of traveling, a lot of late nights, yeah. a lot of uh, significant others don't understand the fact that you're going some 10 o'clock on a Tuesday night, you're going to go do five minutes of time at some stupid bar. Random club, five minutes. Right. You're, Usually, You're taking uh, the time to get there, you're taking the time to spend the evening there, and then you're doing five minutes. Yeah, and there's usually etiquette of like, you stick around for the whole show sure. too. Yeah. It isn't like, in, in Grand Rapids, that's sort of the etiquette. If you live in a bigger city where there's multiple open mics going on per night, yep. and you're like, I got another spot, I gotta get out of here, gotta so you do go. your spot and you leave. Yeah. But um, yeah, there's a lot of time and money investment, and yeah. um, you know, usually when you go to a bar, there's the expectation to like, this establishment is allowing us to tell silly jokes please support them by buying a PBR or whatever. Yeah. And that, so, you know, there's some money. And I, I tell everyone, like, uh, open mics are like your college. Mm -hmm. This is your education into eventually you want to become a professional That's a great at way it. Of putting it. So you, your investment is, like, I'm not putting thousands of dollars into an algebra class. Right. I'm putting thousands of dollars into dick jokes. Yeah, Thank cheers. You. Thank you. Thanks oh, for doing cheers. this. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this. Yeah. The Humpa Lumpa. Humpa Lumpa is a good beer. Humpa Lumpa delicious. So I used to drive hours mm -hmm. to do five minutes at shows. Like uh, in Grand Rapids, when I started, the only open mic was at Dr. Grin's on Thursday night. Yep. And so you had the rest of the week and be like, all right, I got to do stuff. So there used to be a club in Livonia, Michigan called Joey's. Okay. And they did uh, just a straight open mic on Tuesdays. So no real show, no professionals. Yep. I mean, a professional might drop in to do time, but right. it's pretty much everyone of the same lower caliber. Right. So I used to travel the two two and a half hours or whatever to go to Joey's to do time there. Mm. And people today don't understand that because yeah. every, there's so much stuff that's readily available here. Sure. But I would still encourage guys to leave anyway because you Get into leave. other communities. You, right, to go to another community. Does yep. this joke work in front of complete strangers who right. no, no one in here knows who the hell I am. Yeah. And that's the ultimate thing. You don't want to be funny in front of your friends and family because they're going to be really forgiving. <laughs> You're doing it in front of strangers. Like, yeah, oh, this guy sucks, whatever. Sure. So. Uh, I've traveled seven hours to do comedy at a competition in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah. And the guy told me, he's like, you're too funny to win this. And I was like, that's not what you want to hear, right? <laughs> too like, funny to win this. That's nice. The first part was nice. The second yes. part was not nice. Yeah. So, ultimately, all comedy competitions are about you bringing 10 of your friends and me bringing 15 of my friends. I get that sense. Like of the few that I've been to, like Funniest in GR, that sort yeah. of thing. Like yeah. it really seems to be, who'd you bring out to support you? And that's the, that's the, the club. It's the, the business end of comedy. I tell everyone yeah. that it's the comedy business and the business part, for the most part, is more important than the comedy. Yeah. Because I'll tell everyone, like, you can have a show that has, like, Jim Gaffigan, Bill Burr, and Ellen DeGeneres yep. on the show. And if no one's in that room, yep. it doesn't matter how funny they are. Yep. But if you have a room full of, like, uh, you, Tony, and me, mm -hmm. and there's, like, two people that are, are, that's sold out, yeah. the club's going to be like, oh, this is amazing. This is awesome. Which is which is awful. Yeah. The, the business part of comedy is awful. Yeah. So, um Needless to say, I didn't win that contest. Because <laughs> yeah. I knew I wasn't bringing anybody, so. Off camera, Stu and I talked more about the business part of comedy. As you can probably imagine, it's a tough world that requires a lot of tenacity. I admire that about Stu. He's a success and he's a survivor. At one moment in the exchange, we zeroed in on how reality TV distorts reality and often creates false narratives. In Stu's example, one of his stand-up comic pals was made to look like an a-hole through the magic of editing on a very prominent reality show. You could say Stu's pal has got talent and lives in America. Rest assured, with Seared, this show, we're going to give you the honest-to-goodness story, not some bullshit tearjerker moment. I digress. Let's eat some food. All right, I'm ready to eat this, I'm too. I'm hungry. I don't know why how don't, to eat it, man. Why don't we serve it, and then we'll... Just figure out how to eat it. So you grab the first tomato. Okay. 
and the first mots just stabbing okay. those. Okay, just crush it. Yeah, right there. There we go. I'm going to grab right. the next two. All right. Looks pretty fancy. Have you had this before? Uh, once before. Uh-huh. But it was really good. We had to do it again. Now, the waitress said she just eats it with her hands. Yeah, she's, I'm going for it. She's uncivilized. All right, I'm going to go with Just because too. it's a tomato, right? You right. Tomato. What? Tomato juice hands? I don't think I've ever had a yellow tomato before. I thought it was a pineapple. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, I think it's tomato. All right, fair enough. Mm. How is it? It looks good. It's really good. It's awesome. I love it. Very, very good. Is there like a... Is there like barbecue or something on this? Like I, I had a I, weird barbecue smoky. flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get a little smoke too. So some smoke in this? <laughs> She's gone. She's, She's gone. I quit. They'll come back eventually. <laughs> <laughs> These guys. Yeah, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, good. But I, like you said, it's like got that smoky flavor. It does have heavy smoke. I'm like, where does that come from? Yeah, I don't know. It's really Is good. The, the, the balsamic. Maybe it's a smoky drizzle. <laughs> <laughs> That's another new thing I'm learning about. We got the smoky <laughs> drizzle. Yeah. And the soft sticks. And the soft sticks. I like that. It's good. But this is not something like, when we were looking at the menu, this is not something I'd be like, that's that's the thing. I'm going to order that thing. Yeah. Right. It says heirloom. Oh, it says smoked heirloom tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes are smoked. All right. What does it make them heirloom? That's another My question. My grandma <laughs> left this tomato to me. It's an heirloom tomato. Man. Yeah. Passed down tomatoes. Passed down tomatoes doesn't sound as good. <laughs> heirloom no. sounds delicious. Heirloom is much better. <laughs> Swank. This is good. I like it. That was good. Yeah. Was good tomato. Part playful take on a traditional caprese salad and part homage to the lowly cheese stick found in bars across the country, Devani's caprese includes smoked heirloom tomatoes, smoke being our obvious and recurring theme at Devani, panko fried house pulled mozzarella, fresh basil, and a balsamic reduction. It was ridiculously good and the flavors were well balanced. I mean, how often does one enjoy fried cheese on a salad? Awesome. I love America. All right, so the second question I call the fuel. All right. And what I really want to know is... I'm sensing a theme. You're, there's a little bit of a theme. <laughs> thank, thank you for sensing All right. That. So being on the road, what's the reality uh, of it? I, think that, I, I, think, I don't think people understand like what you go through, how much comedy is a lifestyle. Sure. Tell us what it's like on the road and what keeps you going. It's, um, it's pretty lonely, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, usually you're traveling by yourself. Uh, maybe you get lucky and you're gonna work with someone that you know, sure. which is always nice. I always love um, carpooling. Mm. I love traveling with someone that I know. I'm like, all right, this is, this is a guy I get along with. Mm -hmm. We can be in the same car. We're traveling eight hours to go somewhere. We do the shows. We can relate. We can hang out during the day. Because every once in a while you get stuck with someone who you don't know, you don't know how the show's going to go, you mm -hmm. don't know how things are going to work, what they like, what you like, if you're going to mesh. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been plenty of shows where I never even really talked to the other guy I was working with. Right. Because uh, there's the, the structure where there's the headliner, the feature, and the MC. The MC is usually a local person. They're yeah. working their way up. Yep. The feature act is someone usually from out of town, traveling, trying to work their way up the ladder as well, too. Okay. And the headliner is the closer yep. because they've been doing it the longest. They're famous in some capacity. They've done some things, so that's why they're the headliner. Mm -hmm. And when I've featured, there's been some headliners I work with who like want absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the comics. They're no here. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to yep. leave. There is a... Uh, <clears throat> there's the hierarchy of, there's rules, sure. there's rules. Yeah. And one of the rules when you have merchandise to sell is, if you're the feature act, you have to ask the headliner if it's okay for you to sell. To even it, sell merch. Right. To Can't, put something out, a t-shirt, a button. Whatever. Whatever. You, and you just be like, mm. hey, uh, Jay, do you mind if I sell? And the proper response for you is, Yes. Mm -hmm. It's it's a protocol thing of like, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I say. This is what you say. It's a silly dance that we do. But but there you go. Um, I never, throughout the entire weekend, I had never had an opportunity to ask this guy if I could sell. So I never did the whole week. 
And it's always a bummer when that happens as a feed mm -hmm. track because I'm getting paid way less money. Sure. I'm probably, everything's on my dime. Like I didn't even get a hotel room. Right. I had to pay for my own hotel room. Mm -hmm. So it's one of, I need the money more than you do. But, uh, but there you go. So, because it was one of these things that like he was a, a comedian with a lot of credits, yep. television credits, this and that. He never came to the first show like, he didn't show up until I was almost done with my act. Wow. And then he would show up, like, five minutes prior to him being on stage. The he would hero, show up. like, swooping in. Yeah, and... yeah. I gotta save the day! <laughs> that feature was awful, and I needed to turn around the crowd. Wow. And uh, if there was a second show, he would just hide in the green room, of which I was not allowed to go into. <laughs> so Part of this sounds a little ridiculous. Like, right. it does yes, sound... Yes, it, it, it's almost. I always, I always tell people to hire up people to go on the ladder. Yeah the more douchebaggy they kind of become. They could potentially become? Yeah. Are there some people that don't become douchebaggy? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I, uh, uh, Jim Brewer yeah. is one of those guys okay. who is not like that. Yep. It, uh, my first interaction with Jim is very strange. Yep. He came to Dr. Grin's, I'm, I'm in the office area talking with another comic, and he mm -hmm. just kind of strolls into the office. And he's very big from Center Live and Half Baked mm -hmm. and all these other projects he's done. And Grand Rapids is not one of these towns where like big name comics just kind of show up unannounced. Mm -hmm. But he was in town. He had a uh, corporate that he was doing the next day for Gordon Food Services. Yep. And he's like, oh, there's a comedy club in town. I'm going to go check it out. So he showed Try up. Try some Walked in. He didn't even get on stage. No, he, he didn't. didn't even want he to. He was just, I, oh. I asked him. I was like, do you want to get on stage? He's like, ah, I'm just here to hang out. And it, wow. was, uh, it was very strange. And yeah. I've seen him a couple other times over the years just in the audience. And uh, very friendly, yep. super nice. He seemed very agreeable uh, working with the people who open up for him. Mm -hmm. And you get to handpick yep. of like, oh, I, I like this guy, so this guy's coming with me. A lot of clubs, <laughs> yeah. you don't get to. Like that one comic I was talking about earlier, like, sure. he, didn't, he didn't choose me. Sure. Just, the club was like, okay, Stu, you're funny. You get to come in, and now you're working with this guy. Mm -hmm. So that lends itself to, again, like the loneliness part of yep. like, I am now in a town, I am in Louisville, Kentucky, I'm in uh, Dayton, Ohio, I'm in Dallas, Texas, I'm wherever, yep. and I don't know anyone here, and now I'm here for three, four days on my own, Yeah. so what am I going to do? Does that lend itself to, and I mean the loneliness and the travel and that sort of thing, do you feel that lends itself to creating comedy too? Like sure. is, that, is that a part of your process at all? A lot of... A lot of guys, I'm not one of these guys, a yeah, lot sure. of guys will hole up in their room okay. and they're just gonna work on their act. Yeah. They'll watch a video from what they did last night. Uh, they're restructuring jokes, adding right. new tags, whatever this mm. and that. I'm, I should be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe I'd be farther along if I was that guy. <laughs> but I'm the guy who like, when I get to a new town, I'm always like, I don't know if I'm ever coming back to this town. I wanna check this So out. I wanna see what this town has to offer. Yeah, so I do like weird Google searches. Uh, I usually try to look for things that are like for free or mm -hmm. cheaper or just interesting, but, or even if it's just like, uh, hey, what, what's a good restaurant in town? And yep. I always ask people, I'm like, what's a good local place in this town that I can't eat anywhere else? And God bless America, people will still recommend like Olive Garden <laughs> or Red Lobster. Applebee's. Yeah, and I'm like, oh man, I can, <laughs> Applebee's at home, man. We got one of those at home. So I'm always like, just even if you give me like a diner, like yeah. give me a greasy spoon. Yep. And those are my favorite. I love diners. That's what I like to do. I think that's a part of being on the road in America, right? And stop at sure. a side, side of the street diner. The mom and pop shop. Yeah. Just go in there and see what they got to offer. They'll appreciate it more than like Applebee's or Ruby Tuesdays or whatever. Of course. So. Fascinating. And, that, and that's a way for me to keep myself occupied as well, too. Yeah. Like if, I, if I'm not able to hang out with another comic, it's, or sometimes it's the you hang out with the EMC or the local comics in town. So, mm -hmm. yeah. How often do you go out on the road and find someone or do comedy with someone you want to bring back to Grand Rapids? Like, oh, you have to do Grand Rapids sure. or something like that. A lot. A lot? A lot, yeah. You go out, you, you play these other towns where you're surprised at like the caliber of comedy, the, yeah. the MC or guest spotter. The guest spotter is like someone who pops on the show and does like five to eight minutes. Okay. And uh, it's, it's always amazing to see these people in podunk towns. I really like Midwest comedy. Yeah. Like, it seems like New York comedy is a little hard. LA comedy is a little goofy, a little off the wall. Yeah, I still like Midwest comedy, yep. and it was—it's well, the tagline of it's a 
can it play in Peoria? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where I'm at. I'm like, can it play in Grand Rapids? And when I see these guys do their guest spots or their MC or whatever, I'm like, you, you, you'd like to come to Grand Rapids and either either work at the club or yep. come back here for Laugh Fest, or you know, or even if they're just kind of traveling through Michigan uh, to have them come and do some open mics or whatever. So yeah. I've had a lot of guys like stay at my house. I have a spare bedroom. Yeah. So a lot of comics like coming through Grand Rapids, I'll be like, hey, if you need to stay at my place for a day or two, the, the door is open. Actually, that brings up another something else I wanted to ask about, and I think would be interesting for the people watching this. Like, there's also a sense of camaraderie I feel in comedy. At least the shows I've seen locally, like you see comics hanging out with one another, sure. and maybe that's because of the lifestyle similarities and the experience we're, similarities. We're, we're but kindred spirits. Yeah, that's what it seems like. It yeah. does seem like there's some good bonding and friendships there. People. Uh, they use the word civilians. I don't really like using that word. But people who don't do comedy do you prefer, don't like civvies. <laughs> <laughs> skivvies. That's what I like. I like yeah. skivvies. Yeah. Skivvies. People in their skivvies. But uh, it's people outside of comedy don't understand like yeah. what we're doing. Like they talk about bits and skits and okay. things like that. There's just like, a jargon there. It, yeah, we're just we're just trying to work on our jokes. Like this is my act and this yep. is what I do. Hmm. And a lot of people will be like, are you still doing this? I'm mm -hmm. like, well, this was something I yes chose no. to do. So yeah. I'm going to hopefully continue to do it. And, this just popped into my head, and I didn't I didn't have it on any of my cards, but it great. Yeah, it's it's tangents. It, it's yeah tangent. But you, you emceed Grins for a long time. Too long. Too, and that's a, weekly, that's a weekly job. Yeah, yeah. So does that mean new material every week? Like, are you, I would assume so? There was the expectation of new material all the time. Because and you have comedy, you have people coming there regularly right. to see an one, act one week and act the next week. People aren't coming to see me, but I'm the appetizer of the show. Right, you're I, still I get out there, I kind of try to, to set the table and uh, start the show correctly. And yeah. I tell a lot of the new guys too, like being the MC, being funny is kind of like the afterthought. Yeah, It's the welcoming the crowd, getting the announcements right, getting the intros for the comics right. And then uh, if you happen to be funny too, that's a bonus. Yeah. So for me, when I first started, um, I had kind of had my first set. And I don't want to say there were complaints, but there were the whole like, Stu keeps telling the same jokes. Yeah. And so I realized, like, I do need to write more. And so as the MC, because I'm in the same spot every week. Right. If you're a traveling comic, you can do the same act all the time because these people want. don't know tweak it, what tweak the hell it, tweak it, it. Yeah. perfect it, perfect it. And there you go. Yeah. So as the MC, it's more like the, like you said, even if people come just like once a month. Yeah. Like, oh my God, it's this guy again. <laughs> yeah. So you always have to be trying to either add to jokes, dropping jokes, new tags, uh, callbacks, yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I always, every time I saw you up there, I just imagined that job in comedy being the most ridiculous, ridiculously difficult that you could possibly have just from a new material perspective, you know, a different crowd perspective, a new crowd every week. It just seemed like you chose the hardest path possible. Yeah. Yeah. In being was, an MC. I was stupid. Uh, I, I'm grateful for having done it. Yeah. Because over like I did it for 10 years. And yeah. so over the 10 years, I made a lot of good relationships. Yeah. Uh, even with relationships with people in this town, like I got to meet a lot of media, whether it was like through TV or radio right. or the press. And so now that continues to help me now, even though I don't. MC anymore. Don't still, MC anymore. I've established relationships. I know. I know. In my circle of um, you know uh, friends and professional friends, etc., I told them you know I'm interviewing Stu from Dr. Grin, Stu McAllister, and they're like, "Oh, I love Stu!" Like that was always the reaction. I got that all the time. You have no idea how much I got that. That's great. That's nice to hear. Yeah. It's all. It's weird to hear. I'm not a person who accepts compliments well. Okay. No I more think, then? I you think, want me to well, cut the compliment? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep it going. Keep it going. Yeah. But I think it's one of those things of, yeah. uh, I think a lot of comics have uh, maybe poor self-esteem or they're dealing with issues. Yeah. And so that's where the joke telling kind of came from to yeah. kind of help deal with stuff. And for me, maybe maybe that's where that came gotcha. from. Gotcha. There's well a too. well in there somewhere. and <laughs> Right. Right. It's, it's sure. not poisoned, but it might be a little... Right. It might be a little it's dark. It's a little, a little deep. Dark. <laughs> a little, it's a little black. A little... <laughs> yeah, yeah that's fair. So. That's fair. Doing what Devani does best? Hip, edgy twists on classic comforts? The Shrimp and Grits may take its inspiration from the American South, but I think this one is worth traveling to Grand Rapids for. I love this dish. 
shrimp and grits unlike you've ever had. I cannot get enough of this dish. Jumbo shrimp, house smoked bacon, a Cajun white wine butter sauce, and jalapeno pepper grits formed into a firm, delectable cake. See that? See what I mean? Bold, brazen even. Stu summed it up in one phrase. It was great. Yeah. It was not what I thought it would be because when I was expecting it to be just like slop a on a mushy plate. bowl. It was like a, a couple <laughs> shrimp sticking out or whatever, you know? I'd love if they brought it like a cauldron out here and yeah, 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 <laughs> like yeah, scooped exactly. it on. Like pour it. Yes. Yeah, that's what I You have I to was hold not, your bowl. I was not expecting it, no, the bread this type was amazing. texture. Yeah. It was great. And like I said, I haven't had shrimp. I can't tell you the last time I had shrimp. I'm glad we Hopefully, did. I'm not allergic. <laughs> I'll watch for you to get red. <laughs> that's right. Get my I, EpiPen. You live on the edge, man. That's right. That's right. Very good. So uh, the next question is we call the burner, and it's how your approach to comedy, essentially. Oh, yeah. Um, and you've, you've created a lot of different comedy over the years. You've written a lot of different jokes. Right. But how did those come about? When did you drop a joke? When do you refine a joke? Sure. Like, what, what is the process? What can you educate people on who have Boy. never written a joke in their lives? Well, I'll tell new guys to write specifically to themselves. Write For their about, own taste. Write about yourself. Oh. Because, no, well, nobody else can write about you. What you're experiencing, that yeah, sort of thing? Yeah, no, nobody can write about your family, your yeah. relationship with your girlfriend, this, that, or whatever. Yeah. A lot of guys want to come out and they want to do like wordplay jokes, yeah. which I get. Everybody wants to do it. Like a pun? And, like the that puns, way. they think you're clever, this or that, and I, and I get it. Mm -hmm. The problem is, you can come up with the same joke. Yeah. He can come up with the same joke. Yeah. Someone else probably already has come up with a joke before you wrote sure. it. Sure. And that and that and I'm not calling anyone a thief, no. but that's just the reality of it. Yeah, that right? makes sense. Like there is a guy uh, who's my age who started doing comedy like a year ago, so he started late. Mm -hmm. And he's really into the puns and he does it every day on Facebook. He he posts it. He posts a new one. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it is what it is. But I told him uh, at Laugh Us because he was asking me like, "How do you try and make it, honey?" And I, I said, "You got to stop doing that. You know, like, you just have to." <laughs> People have seen it before. They might see it again and not attribute it to you. It's not yours right. in a way. And, and even when you're on stage and you're watching someone on stage yeah. and they're just doing these puns. And maybe just because I'm, I'm jaded and I've seen so much, I'm like, okay, that's clever, but I don't actually really ever laugh out loud. It's not and unexpected. I and it, right, and I don't think most people will really laugh out loud. They, they might appreciate the funniness of it. Sure. But it's not, it, do, it doesn't get what you want when you're trying to work a comedy club and you're working on stage. So write about yourself. I would encourage people to write stories. Mm -hmm. Don't make things short, write long, and you can always uh, embellish. And then you can always add, you can write more tags to jokes, you can do callbacks, which is a joke about something you've already said. Sure. And those are my favorite. If I can write a joke about something I've already said, it's like genius. I just, those are my favorite. Meaning, you, you kind of tell a lot of the joke at the beginning, you tell the rest of your set, and then at the very end, you just... You call back to like maybe the first thing them. you ever said. Yeah. Right? And that's and that's for the people who are kind of paying attention. Like, oh my God, he did it. He, we came full circle or whatever. Do, so that's great. Do those get the laughs, the callbacks? Like, if well executed, yeah. is that the best way to finish a set? Uh, me, I for think your so. Personal? I yeah. think so. Yeah. Not everyone else does. Yeah. But I, I would encourage everybody to go, whoever their favorite, favorite comic is, mm -hmm. uh, watch what they do. Watch what they do that makes you think they're funny. Mm -hmm. uh, watch their interaction with the crowd. Because uh, so much of the stuff too is like facial expressions, okay. mugging for the crowd. Sure. A lot of it's pausing. Like there's so much timing involved with telling a joke. Of, like you just can't be spit firing because then like com or the audience will be laughing and then they might not hear the next thing you say because yeah. you're just going through it like a machine gun and yeah. you can't do that. You gotta slow things down sometimes. Is that a nerves thing usually? Like people, yes. their nerves ramp up and they start going, going faster very quick, and faster. Very quick, very quick. Yeah. And so it's reminding yourself, I just have to slow this down. So slow, just slow take it, it easy, take a breath. Everybody's with you. Relax Pretty much everybody in the crowd probably wants you to succeed. Yeah. So you just you're slowing it down. So, hmm. uh, Interesting. Yeah. So, when you have a young aspiring comic come to you and say, "What's your best piece of advice for my first trip on the road, or something like that, or you know, my best piece of advice for I'm having a hard time with this bit. Should I junk it, or should I write something new?" Like, 
Never throw anything away. No. I'll tell okay. everyone, never throw anything away. Like you can put it on the back burner, you can yeah. just leave it in your book, but, keep but it. you're probably at a point in your career where you can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. But five years from now, you're gonna go back and look at the joke, oh, this is what I need to do to make oh, it funny. Yeah. You're just not funny enough to make that funny. That's interesting. So don't ever throw anything away, yeah. leave That's it and advice. set it. Yeah. And, you know, and then, I mean, maybe you never tell the joke again, maybe you never work with it, maybe it doesn't fit your set because you've grown into something else. But I would say never throw anything away. Are there comedians that are more technical in terms of how they uh, create a narrative around a joke than other comedians? Yeah, some are just kind of sloppy and then they rely upon like their energy and their persona to okay. like carry them through. Like, and I'm not saying that Kevin Hart is sloppy in his joke writing, sure. but he's very personality driven. Like very high it's energy. a lot of facial expressions. Yeah. He's dancing all over the stage. Yeah. He's very high energy, like that's who he is. Would right. I call him a great joke writer? Not necessarily, sure. but he doesn't have to rely on that. Right. He relies on his personality. But then you look at someone like, I don't know if you know who Emo Phillips is. Oh yeah, I know Emo. Emo's been doing, he's a character. Yes. But it's very joke written. It's like the structure of the joke. Yep. It's the pause. It's the timing. Here's the punchline. Right. That's phenomenal. Very technically savvy in terms right. of his joke telling. Right, 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 hmm. right. And I prefer more. And he's got the voice. Of, right. <laughs> it's the whole. <laughs> and he's great. He's great. Yeah. I prefer more his style than yeah. the new Kevin Hart's, but that's just me. Those are just different styles. It's just me. Like you're. When a lot of people just like clean comedy. Yeah. And I'm like, I prefer something that's a little more perverse, a sure. little more dark or blue or whatever. Clean comics, including um, the gentleman who was just in Grand Rapids a few weeks ago, Pat, um, the mid Wisconsin. Oh, Pete Lee. Pete Lee, Pete thank Lee. you so yeah, much. Very clean guy, been yeah. on the Tonight Show like six times exactly. this past year. Super funny, he's clean very comedy. much on the cleaner side of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. doing great. There's him, uh, Keith Alberstadt, yeah. Andy Hendrickson, uh, Kostaki Economopoulos is cleaner. Yeah. A uh, whole bunch of dudes. What are some of the more perverse, dirtier comics that just make <laughs> you laugh every fucking uh, time? Uh, I mean, I love Burr. Burr is at the top of his game right yeah. now, I think. I love Bill Burr. Tom Segura is great. Yes. Yeah, uh, Burr Kreischer is his buddy. Um, what? As dumb as this sounds, there was, um, I don't even call him a duo, but it was a ventriloquist act. It was Otto and George. Okay. Otto was the guy, George was the puppet. He was the worst ventriloquist of all time, but it didn't matter. Right. Because you weren't watching him for the ventriloquism, you're watching for the awful, awful jokes. And uh, he was a very troubled man. <laughs> and, uh, I assume that helps. Oh, it, 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 I think it did help. Yeah. But it also, it, it ended his life. He had a heroin addiction. Yeah. And Otto is, is no more. So, but I would encourage people to wow. either YouTube or just Google Otto and George. And if they don't mind dark, inappropriate for work material. <laughs> oh, I, I, it's some of the funny stuff. I actually, I have a CD. Who has a CD of a ventriloquist act? I do. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually impressed great. that someone thought, you know what we need to do with this ventriloquist act? Record it and put it on a CD. Right. right. People will yeah. love listening to People it. People will love it, yes. Huh. And even the, the puppet is just an awful puppet. It's mm -hmm. something like he made in his garage or whatever. So yeah. it's not. It, it's not good that way. So, but yeah, I prefer I prefer that that darker. It's just kind of like more real to me. Big yeah. J Okerson. Yeah. So. I think you've also experienced so many different types of comedy mm -hmm. that if you have a preference at this point, it's pretty clear why. Like you've experienced all the rest of it. You know this is just where you gravitate. I think it's just it's my not like life. you've seen one comic, yeah, and, and like oh, I'd like kind of my so much just odd shit has happened in my life and. Uh, my background, my educational background is social work, so I've mm -hmm. dealt with like awful things. And you need to have like a, a morbid sense of humor, I think, to kind of help you get through a lot of the stuff we deal with as social workers. Yeah, and absolutely. And so that's definitely influenced my sense of humor and my presentation on stage as a comic. So when you open for a comic who is ridiculously clean versus one who sure. is ridiculously perverse, yeah. Um, do you change your act at all? Yes. Or, or even do you base your act on any type of variety of comic? You know, if they're more um, energetic, do you change your act, et cetera? I, well, first of all, I always ask, like if I'm opening for someone, I'll ask them like, okay, what do you want me or not want me to do? If you're the feature Be and they're the headliner, and because that's, it's you're the, having it's that conversation. Because te it's technically their show. Yeah. So it's their show, what do you want me to do? And if I know someone's clean, then I already know in my brain, like I have to be cleaner. Like 
clean doesn't follow dirty. Right. Clean in front of clean. Like now, if you're a, a dirty comic, usually you can be like whatever in front of you, but you still right. even w would almost prefer someone to be cleaner because then you can be the guy dropping the F-bombs. You, you can be the, the yeah, lunatic or whatever. That makes sense. So generally, as a feature, you just want to be cleaner anyway. Next up, Stu and I talked about Laugh Fest, a community-wide comedy festival that supports Gilda's Club of Grand Rapids, a charitable organization for those battling cancer, survivors, and their families. Laugh Fest has played host to some massive acts, names you know, including Seth Meyers, Martin Short, Amy Schumer, Bill Burr, Kevin Hart, Jim Gaffigan, and of course, our very own Stu McAllister. Here's Stu. When Laugh Fest comes to town, yes. they have a specific show that's clean. And it's for, and they do it in Lowell. Yep. And for whatever reason, they think people in Lowell want a clean show. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I'm from Lowell. Well, I'm not from Lowell. I live in Lowell now, and I oh, love yeah. Pete Lee. So maybe right, there's something right. to that. I don't know. So for f four years in a row, yeah. they asked me to open for the clean comic. Interesting. And I'm like, OK. Yeah. I'm not that guy. I never asked for the show. I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, vie for it. But they offered it to me, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. You have and fans. Then, Somebody loved yeah. you. They were like, we have to have Stu. We need him back. Yes. And then every year, they're like, okay, you know this is a clean show, and da 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 And I'm like, eh, well, So they do know we? you. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I'm like going, there are other people that you could have asked. Yes. Like, clearly, I am not the most appropriate person for this comic, but I will go and I will do it. Like, I know how to tailor my act, and I know when right. to, to pull back, and I know I don't have to say the F word or yep. the S word or whatever. Yeah. And, it, and, and when you're opening for these guys, you're only doing like 15 minutes. Okay. So I, for 15 minutes, I cannot say fuck, right? I can handle that. So, but it, it's weird to me how uh, the, the organization of Laugh Us was like, listen. Yeah. You realize, and I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware. So I've done this, <laughs> but it, so it is. It is the tailoring of, and I know a lot of guys. There are a lot of um, comics who do want to have like a contrasting thing, oh, yeah. whether it's like a male and a female, or yeah. a white person and a black person, yeah. or whatever it is. However, they contrast. And, and so then it, it's because they know, like the headliner knows, this person is not going to talk about the same things I am. Mm -hmm. So there's no overlap. Mm -hmm. And if you can avoid the overlap, it's probably going to make for a better show. I felt like when I saw Seinfeld at Wharton, that mm -hmm. the guy who opened for him, and when we talked on Friday, you mentioned his name, and I was like, I don't know who that is, but now I do know who that is, and I'm blanking on his name, but he would just... Uh, have, Ryan Hamilton. Ryan Hamilton had a re very similar style, mm -hmm. um, and it... I kind of felt like we were already watching the I Seinfeld show. Well, he does a shtick about how he kind of looks like. If, yes. If uh, Elaine and Jerry had a baby, this is what he would <laughs> this be. This is what he, yeah. Sorry. But I think, I think it worked for Seinfeld's act because everyone knows what to expect with Seinfeld. Yes. You're, not, you're not getting a lot of surprises. Right. Although he is different now than when I've seen him in the past, right. for sure. Um, but it, it's just, he's still Seinfeld. And when you get to a big name comic like yeah. that, you can you can throw whatever you want in front of them. People are still matter. there for him because people are there for this person. Yeah, that they're, makes sense. They're there for you, yeah. and like you're not going. I just paid fifty bucks to see you. I'm going to love you, even though you call me a piece of shit the entire time, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're like, oh my god, he called me a piece of shit. I I have nowhere on my cards. I don't think do I have anything about hecklers or actually oh. maybe I do. Sure. But I would love to talk about that later. Like just okay. like the tragic, difficult parts of comedy that oh. you have to deal with because. People are assholes. Yeah. Uh, even though that's not like a fun topic, I think it's reality for ah, people yeah. on the road interacting with the public. It's like this CD YouTube comments that you have to deal with in real life. There are a lot of comics now who are like, this is the guy who destroys hecklers. And like that's their shtick. Oh. And uh, so they want to be heckled then if that's when they're funny. Yeah. The story is it's rigged oh. of. Uh, I've, I've heard numerous things like a person is a plant okay. in the crowd. Like, I'm going to do whatever because you already have the perfect comeback for whatever I yell at you. I assume that was not Michael Richards' approach. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. When people bring up Michael, it's, it's weird to me because Michael, while he was doing stand-up at the Laugh Factory at that yeah. moment, he's not, a, he's not a person that I would call a stand-up. He might be a comedian. He's a, he's a comedic actor. Right. And I think he had done, like, sketch comedy. Maybe yeah. he did some improv. But all of that stuff is different than just straight stand-up. Hmm. So when he got heckled as a stand-up, yeah. 
clearly he handled that inappropriately. Like, I don't know what, I don't know anyone in their right mind who would think like, I need to yell out racial slurs right now to, to ease the tension. Like what? <laughs> you ease the tension. Yeah. So yeah, very yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, that was a really awkward, awkward thing to watch. And I can't imagine being in the audience at that time too, because at, even, as an audience member, if I see a heckler or hear a heckler, it automatically annoys me. And, but then to see a comic handle them well, there's like some satiation there or some, you know, you don't feel as bad or as awkward. But then if you see a comedian who can't handle it, right. it just gets worse and worse yeah. and worse for everyone watching. There's various ways to handle a heckler too. So it's interesting that you already brought up Pete Lee yeah. because Pete Lee, the way he handles hecklers, yeah. it fits into his persona because okay. usually when you think of like a comic handling heckler, it's yeah. like attack. Yes. And Pete Lee, like you don't see Pete Lee attacking no. anybody. So he would always just, he would throw it back on them, kind of like a mom trying to guilt you. Oh. He'd be like, I'm just trying to do my show. Like, Ooh, yeah, why, yeah. Are you, why are you interrupting my show? Yeah. Like, everybody else is having a good time. And yeah. like, that's not how I would handle it, but that was perfect to like perfect what he does on his stage. Like, oh my God, that's great. That yeah. was great. And, and it usually <laughs> works. And like, he's guilting you into shutting up. Yeah. My way of dealing with hecklers is, yeah. I, I don't really get heckled much. I just don't. Why? I think a lot of it's my act. Yeah. My act doesn't really allow you to heckle me. Too busy laughing? Man, they are crying. <laughs> um, and also, I think some of it is me physically. Like, you're I am you're a, tall, dude. I am a tall guy. I'm yeah. six foot five, and while yeah. I'm not like huge, when you're on stage, you're like, that dude is nine feet tall. Yeah. And there is something to be said about someone looking down at you. Yeah. Of like, uh, I mean, that's why when you look like judges sit up high. Yes. Like even like you go into like a pharmacy, the pharmacists are up high. Like yep. they're up high. People who are, are higher than you have that stature, they have that yeah. power. And so I think a lot of that is just like, it's just me as a human being. Like I'm not going to be. Mm -hmm. But when I do, I'm not going to back down from you. I'm yeah. going to handle you with whatever you have to say to me. And usually it's like, I'm going to stop the show. What did you say? Yeah. And then they don't respond. Yeah. It's like, all right, this is your time. Let's do this. Yeah. Let's dance the dance. You want to dance. Let's go. I would assume that most hecklers think they're going to stay anonymous. Yes. And as soon as you start, as soon as you stop your show and offer them the opportunity to engage, right. there's a lot that back down. Sure. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's a voice from the darkness. Because when you're on stage, you, re you legitim legitimately, you can't see much. Yeah. You can see maybe the first row of people, but beyond that, it's just darkness. It's like maybe a couple eyeballs and yeah, some you glitter. Yeah, you and... can't, until someone like you put your hand yeah. over your eyes to block out the light, you really mm -hmm. can't see anything. So it's, if someone yells out something, I mean, I don't know who said it, I don't. So it's like, feel free to say it now and we can adjust and I can address it. And uh, you know, some, I, I, man, I've had some bad hackles. I've had some, like, people just like, hammered me. Okay, that's they're what not I was a, They're not enjoying the act. They're not enjoying they're the act. They're not enjoying the act. And they're coming after and they're you coming as an attack. Me. And I'm like, oh, that was a dagger to the heart. And uh, like, there was uh, one point where I start to do my merch pitch, like I'm trying to sell my t-shirt. Yeah. I'm like, hey, I hope you guys are having a good time. And one guy was like, I'm not, or whatever. <laughs> And then I was like, oh man, uh, is there anything I can do to make it better for you? And he's like, just keep going, keep <laughs> going. Like he's just like, just, just get through your bullshit and get to the next act. Okay, let's do that. And it was, yeah. And there's nothing like, okay, man. Like it's just. Like, how do you, how, yeah, how do you come back from that? I don't, yeah. I don't. I, I it was sir, like, I admit defeat. Congratulations. I, you, you, victory for you, sir. Yeah. And, and like, and for me too, like a lot of the comics, there's a hundred people in the room and 99 are laughing and one person's just not. Yeah. And a lot of comics will focus on that one person. In, like, in why the sense are of like you not laughing? Getting them to laugh? Getting them to laugh. Even though they could have a thousand things going on in their life. They right. just, yes. yeah. Yes. Like why? And, or they might be having a good time, but yeah. some people will just sit there and be like, yeah. And Rest, that's, and that's just how they are. Yeah, yeah they they just just, look, that's who they are. They're having a good time. He doesn't look like he's having fun. And so yeah. I have learned over the years to like, Fuck that person. Yeah. I'm gonna focus it's cause sometimes it's These 100 people in the room, 99 are not having a good time. Well the one is. And then I go focus on the one that's having a good time. It's <laughs> like I'm just having, having a good a time. conversation with you, but it's you and me, baby. We are kindred spirits. <laughs> yeah, we're doing this. And and because I'm like when I'm on stage, this is for me. Yeah. Uh, you guys are coming along for the ride, man. Yeah. 
and uh, I'm having a good time, and hopefully you're having a good time, and I'm getting paid when this is done. Thank, yeah. you, thank you and good night. That's the end of the night right there. Like, I get paid after this. I was here for, you know, myself and our, your entertainment. That's kind of it. And I've had some, I've had some rough shows where uh, there was one show where no one came. Not one person came for the show. Do you do your set? Well, I was featuring at the time. Yeah. And this was in Ohio. I had never been to this venue before. It was like some weird bar. Yeah. And uh, I'd never worked with this headliner. And for whatever reason, no, no one, it's a bar. I'm like, how is no one like just accidentally in this bar to get a drink, right? That's yeah. just very strange to me. How is there no like Cliff and like- Yeah, Cliff and Norm just <laughs> yeah, chilling. Here here. Like, hey. There's gotta be someone here, yeah, yes. <laughs> like I'm all like, the time. How awful is your bar that no one is here? Yeah, that's so, rare. So no one came and like 15 minutes after the show was supposed to start, no one came. So the, the headliner's are like, well, what are we gonna do? And I'm like, we're getting fucking paid. That's yeah. what we're gonna do. The owner comes over and he's like, "Listen, uh, clearly, no one's coming. Yeah. So what we can do is uh, we can give you guys a rain check." And I said, "I don't know what that means. What right. is, tell me what rain check means." Does that he's mean you like, pay me now and pay me again? Well, <laughs> what it meant for him yeah. was, uh, "We won't pay you now, right? But we'll have you come back real soon right. and to do another show." And I said. Absolutely not. You're yeah. paying me for tonight. My yeah. job as a comic is to show up and do my act. Yeah. Now you as the owner get to choose the whether we're going to do the show or not, but I can fulfill my contractual obligation yeah. of showing up and I'm ready to do the show. So what he did is he had us perform for the staff. So there were like six staff there. That's not a bad... It was still weird because he's pulling people from the kitchen and yeah. the bartenders and stuff. And so we did our act and he paid us hmm. uh, and I never went back, but I'm okay with it. Yeah. Because who's to say like, I'll be like, okay, I'll take the rain check. And then I, uh, and then I come back and then it's the same shit again. Like, yeah. why would I want to come back to this bullshit? This is awful, why yeah. would I? And I drove five hours. I'm like, I'm not driving five hours to not get paid, huh. right? So much of uh, comedy, like comedians, I don't know which comedian told me this. It's like, you don't tell me to tell jokes. You don't pay me to tell jokes. You pay me to drive to tell jokes. And that's Ooh, what I, I like do. that. Yeah. Right. Like I, I'll tell my jokes for free. Yeah. But you're paying me to get there. Yeah. So this is yeah. You're paying for all the components of the performance, including because there's a lot to it. Yeah. There's a lot to me getting to to you to tell these silly things. Do you? Are th are there behind the scenes moments that are just like sheer breakdowns, or you know, like someone's like I can't go on, or are there be behind the scenes moments where? You know, a comedian gets too drunk and can't go on, and someone has to fill in for him. Like, um, in your experience at Dr. Grin's for, for years, yeah. what'd you see? There was a comic who got on stage, and I won't say his name. No, that's but okay. But he proceeded to eat shit. Yes. He ate shit on Thursday, he ate shit both shows Friday, and then after both shows, he was the headliner, mm -hmm. and he ate shit. And he goes, can we, can we go get something to eat? I'm like, all right. So I was emceeing. Yep. So me and the feature act and this headliner, who's a famous headliner, who's been on TV numerous times. We went over to Z's, the other bar in town, a late yeah. night food. And he essentially, he's in the booth and he's like, fuck comedy. This sucks. I just want to go home. It's <laughs> awful. And it, this is a guy who's successful. Like, yeah. He's in the business. He's made it. Yeah. And so me and the feature were staring at each other like, what the fuck are we supposed to do here? Yeah. And so we just kind of like pat him on the back and we're like, it'll get better, man. Yeah. I don't I was tired. Maybe. And then <laughs> thank, thankfully he had good shows, both shows on Saturday. Yeah. But it's one of these things like this is a guy who's, who's been on Conan, The yeah. Tonight Show, and he's lamenting everything that he's done up until this point. Huh. And you're like, ah, oh, God, I want to be you. Yeah. And you hate your life. God. Do, do you think the shows on Thursday and Friday, like, were there themes? Like, was it the crowd? Was it the, his, his, it's his hard show? To say. Yeah. It's hard to say. Just the wrong mix. Wrong Just, mix, was, wrong time. He was a, he's a little Traffic eclectic. Was bad. It's a little different. Okay. It's a little odd. Yeah. Uh, it isn't necessarily 
tailored for Midwest, but okay. it's still funny. Still yeah. funny. Like I always thought he was funny. And they were just misses. And it just people. It was just going over people's heads. They were just weren't picking up what he was putting down. Yeah. He has not been back since. <laughs> I, I don't can, know. If I can the, imagine that. I don't know if it's the club's choice or his choice. Yeah. But uh, I mean, he's even been in some movies and stuff. I'm like, oh man, I wish he'd come back. But yeah, you know, it's a little sad. Whatever. Uh, Maria Bamford. Do you know Maria Bamford? Yes. Yeah, very strange yes, to me. Yes, yes. Kind of awkward. Very, very awkward, yes. very weird. Yep. A lot of weird things going on. Her first CD is called Burning Bridges. Mm -hmm. And uh, i big fan of comedy. I collect a lot of comedy CDs and DVDs and whatever, and I had that one. Mm -hmm. And I like I liked CDs still. I know it's all like downloads and whatever. But I like the physical aspect because it's like pictures yep. and thank you There's liner notes, yeah. things like that. Yeah. And so I'm reading the liner notes and, and she's talking about all the clubs that she's been banned from and Dr. Grins was one of the clubs. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, what? And I'm like thinking, okay, I mean, this was before I started there. Yeah. But I'm, I'm thinking, okay, clearly she also is another comic who is, who's just a little odd yep. and can go over a lot of people's heads. Yep. And uh, so maybe back in the day when she came, she just ate shit. I think sometimes people don't know if they should laugh at awkward or not, in the Midwest at least. Like, yes, yes. Awkward, and you even think of like big shows like um, The Office, kind of, which kind of base a lot of their comedy on awkwardness. On awkwardness right? I, I know I have some friends who will say, I love The Office, but I, there are certain episodes I won't watch Cringeworthy, because, yeah, because it so makes me cringe so much. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of wonder if it's, there's a theme in the comedians that you just spoke about, like maybe. Maybe there's awkward. Maria's stuff. been back to do laugh. Have they? I would love okay. to have her come back and do Doctor Grins. Yeah, but, uh, maybe it was maybe a strange. Yeah, it's strange. strange. So the fifth question, we kind of bounced around a little bit, yeah, but yeah. it's called the grill. It's typically a little like like grilling stew, grilling the guests right, or whatever. Let's do this. Yeah, but it's really about some of the things we already talked about: bombing, heckling, Ooh. bad shows. Yeah. I, I assume that all of these are reality. Oh, every show. <laughs> but I mean, tell me some of your worst experiences, some of your best ex experiences. That sort of thing. I mean, just let's let's start with bombing, right? That's the, yeah. Everybody wants. No one wants to know when you succeed. They want to know when you. Eat I want to. I want to talk about those two, though. Why don't we add sure. it? Sure. We'll add it in. Um, the uh, the bombing thing will always be. Um, I did a, a pastor appreciation night. Those the, I didn't know those were. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it was not not good. It was uh, some church down towards Kalamazoo, yep. and there was this comic. Back in the day, he's not a comic. He was a pastor yep. who dabbled in comedy. Okay, and so they're having this pastor appreciation night that I'm assuming he was responsible for running. And he was like, "Hey, would you like to come and do some time at our show?" Yeah, and I wasn't Thank you. super long into doing comedy a couple of years. Yeah, and um, I was like, "You, you know what I do, right? It isn't like I." I'm saving this clean shit yeah. for another day. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he was like, oh, yeah, you know, just come do your stuff. So he uh, got me and another comic to go down, and we were doing it, and it was at this church, and it was really big. Yep. And um, my buddy Adam went on first, and Adam's very much into crowd work, so he was doing crowd work. Is that Adam Deggy? Adam Deggy, okay. yeah. And he's like nailing Catholics, like, you know. He's just, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, those crazy Catholics. You know, he's just straight destroying. You right. Know? And then I get on stage, and I, I, I was not, I should not have been there. I should not have been there. Just, I should have said no. It was a mismatch. And oh, completely. That's what happened. And my act uh, wasn't geared for what these people wanted. Like, it was weird. Old, the older pastors are just older people up close, and yeah. there were younger people who were sitting in the back. And it yeah. was light. Like, it was not like a club, so I could see everybody, I could see everything. And uh, the, the kids in the back, the young adults in the back, were loving everything I said. And I think a lot of it had to do with how, like, just awkward and inappropriate it was. Like, this, yeah. you should not be saying these things at a church, sir. Like, you know, <laughs> it was one of those things. And I, uh, they even turned off the mic on me. They did not really? Oh yeah, they turned off the mic. And I yelled out my last two jokes. I am not leaving <laughs> till I tell these two awful jokes. <laughs> this, and it was bad, it was very bad. This yeah. is funny though, in oh, retrospect. Yes, yeah. I don't, think, yeah. Uh, I don't think a lot of bombing stories are usually that funny <laughs> after the fact, but this oh, is good. God, and it was, 
it was in just the ride home because I rode with the pastor. Oh. Like Adam and I rode with the pastor back to Grand Rapids <laughs> where I'm in his minivan going, ah, oh, can I just jump out the car right now in my life? And it, yeah, it was, it was awful. Jesus, and, I mean, it's a Jesus take the wheel moment. Please, <laughs> Jesus kill me right now. Strangle me to death. I mean, in a, it's weird to me when I hear comics talk about how like they've never bombed. Mm-hmm. And it's always new guys. It's mm-hmm. people who haven't been doing it very long. Yes. I've never bombed. Because yes. everybody will admit, I, you, you eventually you're going to get in front of a crowd that doesn't care who you are and yep. doesn't care what you do or what you say. Yeah. And that just happens. That happens. I had another one. I was in Holly, Michigan. Okay. There's, there's a club there. It's called the Holly Hotel. It's not a hotel anymore. It's a, it's a fancy restaurant like this. Like this. And they have a comedy club in the basement. Yeah. And every Friday, Saturday, they do shows. And I was, uh, I was there featuring for my buddy Dave Dyer. Yep. And uh, I was proceeding to eat a huge bag of shit. And uh, there were four, like 14 people in the room. 12 were just hammered out of their mind drunk. They didn't even know where they were. Right. And one couple who was paying attention and having a good time. And I'm telling jokes and they're just not like getting nothing. And so I just go, well, some of these jokes are just for me. And then some drunk woke up out of his stupor <laughs> and yells, you should just keep them to yourself. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, my God. It was, it was wonderful. It was, yes. it was funny for what he said. For what he and said. It was a dagger in my heart yeah. for me trying to tell jokes and, and just not getting anything. But that's just, I mean, this that's is just, how it is. It's the reality, reality of the job. It's the reality of the job of like, yeah. you don't, I mean, there have been plenty of times where I'm like, I'm going to get on stage and eat shit. And I have it, and it's been great. Tell, and there have been other times where I'm going to straight destroy it, and then I eat shit. Tell me, about, uh, tell me about some of the successes. Let's go to the other end. I mean, this show is... It's harder for me to think about right now. Yeah, I mean, because there's so many. So few. There are so, so few successes in I my life. True. I mean, tell us about like the, the, some of the bigger spots you played, just some where the crowds were good, like yeah. that sort of thing. Um, I've, uh, Funny Bone is, is a big comedy chain in the mm-hmm. country. There's like 12 or whatever. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to work a couple with my buddy Nick Griffin, okay. uh, who's brought me along. And um, they're big, they mean, they mean things. They pay very well uh, and they have like, if you do well, then you can do all the other rooms, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it was always nice working those rooms because I'd get on stage and I would do well and I'd destroy it. I've never, I've never been to Hartford, uh, Connecticut before, but mm-hmm. then I get on stage and I did great. And it was just a good thing. Good moments. Um, there have been other times where I've auditioned for stuff mm-hmm. and uh, the auditions didn't turn out how I would like. Mm-hmm. There have been other times where I've done festivals where I, oh my God, I got in the Laughing Skull Festival in Atlanta, which is it's a pretty big festival and mm-hmm. I got in two years in a row and uh, things weren't really well for me there. Crowd loved you. And I got to meet, yeah, crowd loved me and I got to meet some cool people, interact with some uh, interesting <laughs> interesting folk and see Good. some things. So yeah, no, yeah. There, there have been a lot of ups and downs in comedy. Yeah. And I've, I, I wouldn't say, there are some things I would change, but for the most part, I've been very happy with stuff. So. Yeah. While Devani isn't shy about bold flavors and unconventional pairings, their food isn't just smoke and mirrors they understand the fundamentals of fine cuisine. And while the name might run contrary to the concept of fine cuisine, the airline chicken breast is a great example. Also known as the Statler chicken, it is a nickname for a cut that is comprised of the chicken breast with the drumette attached and is a staple in haute cuisine. Having the bone in not only makes the presentation more interesting, but also ensures the fattest part of the breast cooks rather evenly due to the balanced heat transfer provided by the bone. This cut is superior to your standard, boring, flat chicken breast. Do yourself a favor, find an airline chicken breast, or even make your own. Just try it. You will love it. Should we eat this thing? Sure. All right. It is the uh, jerk you, chicken. I'll give you the. You want me to do this? The ceremonial death. Oh, man, I feel like this is a challenge. Like you just threw down like, like survivor challenge yeah, or whatever. Yeah, there exactly. One of us is getting chicken. One of That's us great. is not. One of us is gonna get the rice and beans underneath <laughs> it. Yeah. All right. Grab your this that with mine? your fork. Yeah. All right. I would have never ordered this. It's fantastic. Oh. No. See, I generally I lean towards the chicken anyway. Yeah. Uh, even before like the whole not eating mammals yeah. thing that I'm doing, I would I gravitate towards chicken. So you would order like a steak or pork chops or something. I like, like yeah. I like a lot of pork. Mm-hmm. Kind of gravitate towards sure. pork stuff, ribs. Yeah, tenderloin medallions, all that stuff. 
that's the thing with my new diet of yeah. like going, man, I really love bacon, mm -hmm. and now I can't. Yeah. Or like pulled pork sandwiches. I pulled love are great. barbecue. Barbecue, everything sauce. barbecue is about pork. Yeah. It's not about chicken. Like, no, not very often. If like you barbecue chicken, like I, it's it's on the back burner. It's all pork now. Do you do any shows in Lansing? Does Lansing even have a comedy? Location? Lansing does not have a comedy club anymore. They used to, right? They, they had one called Connections, Connections, and that one was forever. Mm -hmm. And it is now like in Napa Auto Parts or something. Oh, like okay. the whole building got bulldozed gotcha. or whatever. Um, and then they had another one called uh, Trippers. Yep. And But that only lasted like a year and a half, two years. And so now they don't have any, which is weird because you would think like the state capital very large yes. uh, state university though they, they would have something but they don't but they have some relatively successful open mics mm -hmm. and i will be there on saturday this saturday this saturday uh they, they're calling it the power hour okay and they're going to have um a comedian get on every minute so for an hour you're going to see 60 comics Holy and they're going to do a minute each so i'm going to be one of those comics just doing a minute of time the very last thing we okay. actually started to hit on it is okay. what's next for Stu? Boy. So I, I, you know, because you're not the MC at Grins anymore. Sure. I just, I, I have to be able to find my Stu, Stu right? Like, <laughs> like I have to, where do I go see Stu? What is going on with Stu? Yeah, um, so this Saturday won't matter to the people who kind of no, are coming up, but. It won't matter. Are you, are you gonna, can, let's talk kind of at the high level. Are you gonna keep doing kind of the open mic shows, mm -hmm. the book your own shows, the feature shows? Sure. Do you, you're your own agent, right? You're your own manager? I, you seek these I out? book myself. You, it's, it's one of those things that like I told you, like you don't have an agent or a manager until they can make money off until, of yeah. it. And I barely make money off of it, <laughs> so. So, but you do have a website. I do, yep, and it's you, just stumacallister.com. Stumacallister.com, you also have your podcast. Podcast, the Elemental Podcast. Yeah, yep. which by the way, I is a tongue twister for me for some reason. It's weird for I don't. I don't know where I to know. stop the alphabet <laughs> yes yes it's elemental the elemental podcast. p, p podcast. podcast yeah but like it's elemental because elemental p is a yes. silly joke that i do gotcha and so because the podcast originally was studio 1534 okay and then someone recommended the change I'm like that is a great name mm -hmm. so we just changed it and whatever so the I'm, uh, we're gonna do a live podcast uh, which will be when is uh, that? It's going to be July nineteenth. It's a Friday. Yeah, and it's going to be at the guest house over there. What is it on Alpine? I think We're, it's over on the northwest side of Grand Rapids. We are very likely to launch your episode on uh, July eighteenth. What? So it'll be the next day. Yeah. Well, people watch. If the, I, you have a one day notice. <laughs> one day notice. Go. One day notice. Tomorrow. Yeah. And it's uh, it'll be live. So because people were asking, are you ever going to do a live one? And I think that's for cool. me. Doing a live podcast is very self-serving and it's very sure. ego-driven. Yeah, but I'm like, I expect five people to be there, and we're just going to be dumb. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I, I just want to be dumb, have some fun, and, and there we go. Yeah, because I, I I spend too much of my time worrying about other things, mm -hmm. and now I just know I just can't worry about these other things because so many of these people are in control of stuff. Yeah, it and when they tell me no. Okay, and then I move on to other stuff. I, one of my favorite comics gave me the advice of like, focus on the people who care about you. Mm, yeah. So I'm not gonna focus on this, these clubs and bookers and festivals who don't want to have anything to do with me. Because yeah. like, what? it's wasted energy. Yeah, so I'm gonna focus energy. on my own stuff and other people who are interested. You have a ton of connections, you're meeting people all the time. Yeah. You can reach out to people who you know in a lot of different ways and for a lot of different reasons who trust your comedy, trust that you're awesome and will go see you. <laughs> I mean, you're, why not use sure. those connections? I right. mean, a lot of times it's who you know, not what you know, or sure. what, you, you know, what you're perceived to be. A lot to be. of it is that way. Yeah. Like, I'll tell uh, new people, if they ever have an opportunity for someone to take them somewhere, to just to let that happen, just to do let it. to go and to do it because that's great advice. They're opening a door for you that might be closed for years. Because there was a club that I've been trying to get into for at least two, three years, and they just kept saying no. Yeah. And then a friend of mine was like, "Okay, you're going to come with me, and we're going to do this club." We did it. And then the owner was like, "Where have you been?" And I'm like, "I've been knocking on your door for three years, you son of a bitch." So. I I think that's interesting because. I think about comedians as a whole, the comedians I see a lot and the comedians I don't see a lot, a lot of times it's not based on the caliber of their comedy that I don't see them. Right. It's based on whether or not they got into a club or knew somebody or came along with somebody or paired yeah. with somebody. 
you know, it's not a quality thing very often. A lot of it's luck. Yeah. A lot of it's just hard work. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's the one thing I control is how hard I work. So I'm just going to continue working. I'm working on, I think I told you I'm working on a humor book. Yep. <clears throat> I got a script that I have been <laughs> delinquent in working on. And I'm taking some sketch classes. I'm yeah. just trying to do different things. But the point is, you're working on the podcast. You're yeah. working on your comedy constantly. You're working on the humor book. Right. That's Stu McAllister. That's me. Thank you. Oh, thanks, man. This thanks. was awesome. That was a good time. It was great food, man. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. This is, you know, Devani is a gem of downtown Grand Rapids, and yeah. it's right next to the arena. And You know what my favorite access? kind of food is? What's your favorite kind free. of food? <laughs> well, free. Well, you got free food. <laughs> is that why you said yes to this? Sure, I, free food. I thought we were friends. That was because I, <laughs> that was because I knew how, Scott nah. Hibbs, and you were nah. like. Scott Hibbs, yeah. free food. Free, <laughs> free food. food. All right, fair enough. Good. Thanks again, Stu. Thank you. Sticks. What is soft sticks? Uh, so I'm not like slamming in your face. Oh. It'd be a bit intimidating sometimes. I thought it was like a sexual oh. term. I thought it was at first. Dude's got some soft sticks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Troy, that's insulting, man. <laughs> we don't know each other that way. <laughs>